So this book is called Above the Ground, a true story of the troubles in Northern Ireland. And it's a story of the life of Kevin Barry Art, who was a young man who grew up in Belfast during the worst times of the troubles, uh, the late 60s and throughout the 70s, and um, found himself falsely accused of uh, a notorious murder of a British official in 1981. So that's the cover for you. And um, that is a mugshot of Kevin Barry Art, my subject, that was taken at the Mays prison on the day that he arrived there, which was August 5, 1983. Um, Kevin Barry Art was born in a convent in uh, a little town called Castle Pollard in County West Meath in the Republic of Ireland. His parents were teenagers. They were unwed at the time. They later got married. Uh, his father was Protestant, his mother was Catholic. And at that time in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, which was 1959, if you were the product of an out of wedlock birth, this is, this is where you wound up going to be born. Uh, they got you out of town into a convent that was run by nuns. I took this photograph in 2016. You see the swing sets in front. It's all uh, derelict and now, and those swing sets are pretty rusty. But that's where the story of Kevin Barry Art uh, began when he was born in 1959. Because of the, you know, the various reasons why his birth parents, you know, couldn't raise him, he was adopted by his um, aunt and uncle. Uh, the gentleman in the tie that you see is John Art, who's his adoptive dad, who had a uh, small gas station and a diner outside of Belfast. Um, that's his mom, Maeve Art, John's wife, and that's Kevin Barry Art, uh, who might be about eight years old in that photograph. In 1969, the troubles really exploded um, in Belfast. Uh, for reasons that you probably know if you've learned anything about the Troubles, but if you haven't, in 1969, there was uh, rioting in the streets and many homes of Catholics uh, who lived in very segregated parts of town were burned and, and looted. And the British army uh, was called in at some point to try to keep order because the local police, the RUC couldn't do it. And Kevin grew up in a, fairly affluent suburb of Belfast, and his mom and dad really shielded him from the troubles, from the IRA, from the news of what was going on with the troubles. But Kevin happened to be in a car uh, riding back home with his mom from a visit to his grandmother's house in Anderson Town in Belfast, which was a very Catholic and heavily Republican enclave. And they drove by an area where they saw uh, burning homes. And Kevin, at the time, was 10 years old, and it was his first exposure uh, to the Troubles, was a, a site that probably looked a lot like what you see in this photograph. He left home at age 15. He had a quarrel with his mom over his girlfriend, whose name was Lorraine Keenan, and he moved in to a part of Belfast uh, that was called New Lodge, which again was a very heavily Catholic area and a very working class area. And these murals here and the graffiti that you see it was his first exposure as a young man to what the troubles were uh, really all about. That word that you see under the Irish tricolor there, sertia, is an Irish word uh, that means freedom. That's Albert Miles and his wife, uh, Florence, in the summer of 1977. Albert Miles was a deputy governor of the Mays Prison. The Mays Prison uh, opened in about 1976, and it was the place where uh, it was designed to hold IRA prisoners. Um, we would call the head of the prison administration here in the States a warden. In Northern Ireland, they would call that person the governor. Albert Miles was the second in command, or you know, the deputy warden, what we would call, what they called their the deputy governor. That's him on vacation uh, with his wife, Florence. And it was with the murder of Albert Miles that the bad part of uh, Kevin Art's um, story begins. So the British uh, had decided in the 1970s that the way that they were dealing with the IRA and the Republican movement was all wrong. They were 
taking IRA men and suspected IRA men, and they were um, putting them in internment. And they were essentially treating them as political prisoners. They were letting them wear their own clothes. They were letting them basically freely associate with one another. And you know, to no one's surprise, or maybe to the British's surprise, when these guys came out, they would go straight back to IRA service and probably be better trained and more indoctrinated than they had been when they went in. So the British government decided on a change of course in the late 70s, and they instituted what they called a policy of criminalization, whereby they said, political prisoners, you know, pish posh, you know, you, you kill somebody, you're a murderer. You rob a bank, you're a bank robber. We're going to start treating the IRA like that. And Margaret Thatcher wasn't the architect of that, but she really um, presided over a time in the history of Northern Ireland when the controversy over that policy of criminalization came to a head inside the Mays prison. The Mays prison was designed to hold IRA prisoners, um, and they were told that they were going to wear prison issued uniforms, they were going to do prison work, they were going to be treated like the common criminals that they were. The IRA men disagreed with that and an escalating series of protests that culminated in the hunger strikes of 1980 and 1981 ensued. Um, Margaret Thatcher was controversial in some circles because her she took a very hard line. She said, uh, if you want to starve yourself to death, you know, by all means, go ahead. And if any of you have heard of Bobby Sands, he was the first IRA man to starve himself to death in a hunger strike that culminated ultimately in 10 hunger strikers um, losing their lives. This is a photograph of uh, Prime Minister Thatcher on a visit to Northern Ireland in 1981, I believe, at about the same time that um, Kevin Berryart was arrested for the second time. And speaking of that, there is his mugshot. They uh, took all his clothes off and just before they uh, took that mugshot, uh, it was in the early hours of the morning, they woke him up, um, arrested him and hustled him over to Castle Ray. I think it was December, December 5th, maybe. Um, Castle Ray Interrogation Center is a place that you will read about if you read the book. It was a place where suspected uh, IRA men, terrorists, the British would tell you, were taken to be interrogated under the emergency laws. And we are in a law school and we'll get to a little bit about the role of lawyers and all this. Um, a suspect could be detained for up to seven days and questioned without access to his lawyer or his family or uh, anything. <clears throat> Castle Ray was notorious. It was a tough place to go. It was a tough place to be. And many confessions were gained by the detectives inside Castle Ray. We don't have any photographs. And in doing the research for Above the Ground, I really looked for any photographs of the inside of Castle Ray that I could find. I couldn't find any. Maybe there aren't any, except that the British have. Uh, under wraps to this day. So this is a watercolor that was painted by Kevin Berryard from memory of what his cell looked like um, inside Castle Ray, uh, where the lights were kept on 24 hours a day so that you would not be able to sleep. And that's where his trial was. That's the Belfast Crown Court. Um, that photo was taken pretty recently. That courthouse is now derelict, but um, that's what it looked like. The trial was presided over by um, Judge Basil Kelly, and that's a photograph of Basil Kelly. Under the emergency laws, juries were done away with for offenses, um, so-called scheduled offenses, terrorist offenses, and a single judge would preside over a trial. Basil Kelly was a member of the Orange Order, which was an anti-Catholic fraternal organization whose members wore black bowlers on their big uh, patriotic holidays. And here you see him kind of scowling, which may... Uh, capture him a little bit. This is a tunnel underneath uh, the street that ran from the Kremlin Road Trail to the Belfast Crown Courthouse that we saw a moment ago. And this was the tunnel that uh, Kevin Berryart and his, the other co-defendants would walk every day to and from their trial. Uh, he was convicted, of course, um, based on a false confession that he gave uh, in Castle Ray and sent to the maze a prison, and this is his mugshot on his admission to the maze on August 5, 1983. And that's an aerial shot of the maze. It's no longer there, it's been torn down, but it was basically a five-sided sort of hexagonal um, facility that was built on the site of an old 
British uh, Aria airfield. Maybe you can make out the shapes of the cell blocks, which were called H blocks because they look like they're in the form of an H, and that's where the prisoners um, were held. These H blocks were designed basically to be jails within jails or prisons within prisons. If you got out, then there was a wall and a gate that you had to pass through. And then if you got through that, there was another one and another one. There were seven in all. And if you tried to walk, for example, from H7 all the way to the outer wall, the perimeter wall, which you see there around the perimeter, uh, that would be walking the better part of a half a mile. Um, so this was the prison that the IRA took it upon itself to launch a mass escape from. Because in 1983, the IRA was sort of on the ropes in the war with the British. Thatcher had come down very hard on them. There was a lot of public sentiment against the IRA because of the loss of civilian life and a lot of what seemed to be just sort of uh, psychotic violence that they were um, committing. And it was thought by the leadership that they needed something big. They were never gonna, you know, be able to defeat the British Army, but what if they could do a big escape and have some of their biggest names break out and really embarrass the British? What if they could do that? So that was the genesis of um, the escape from the maze. That's a shot of uh, the gate that would be outside the H block that you or a vehicle with you inside it would have to pack through. The escape had several leaders. One of them was this guy, Jerry Kelly. Uh, who was serving time in the maze because he had tried to blow up the Old Bailey, which is a famous courthouse in London. And um, Jerry, along with other um, members of the Army Council, the IRA, devised a plan. There had been efforts to tunnel out of the maze. They always failed. There had been other you know, efforts to get out by this and that means. They always failed. So it was decided in the end, the way to get out of the maze was to get inside a food truck. There, were food, there was a food truck that went around to each cell block each day to deliver the food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What if they could hijack that truck? What if they could get the guards? Uh, what if they could overwhelm the guards, um, take their uniforms, tie them up, impersonate the guards, load up the back of the truck with fellow prisoners, and drive out the front gate? That was essentially it. And Jerry was one of the planners of that. These are all a subset of men who escaped that day, September 25, 1983. There's Jerry Kelly in the top right, Paul Kane uh, in the top of the middle. I can't make out the guy in the top left. There's Kevin Berry, of course, um, Brendy Mead, and Renty Friars. And this shot is hard to see, but this is a British government compilation of all the maze escapees that were still at large in the early 90s that had not been captured, that were still on the land. And um, Kevin Barriard, you see second from the left on the bottom. By the mid 90s, Kevin Barriard was living in California. The FBI caught up to him eventually with the help of the British government. They put him in jail and he enlisted the pro bono services of a renowned uh, trial lawyer, Jim Brosnahan from Morrison and Forster in San Francisco, who took, who took on the case uh, pro bono and put in, I don't know how many thousands of hours and uh, over a million dollars in unreimbursed out-of-pocket costs to try to help Kevin Berryard resist extradition back to Northern Ireland. And this is a shot of Kevin and Jim Brosnahan at, at Jim's office in San Francisco. Uh, and this is Kevin uh, showing up at Jim's office to do his legal work for the day, riding the cable car. Uh, and uh, that the files that you see in the back will maybe give a flavor of the volume of the uh, research that needed to be done to defend him in California in the federal court uh, in his extradition trial. The trial that he had in Belfast lasted almost 10 months. So there'd been hundreds of witnesses who testified in that trial. All that testimony needed to be obviously understood and uh, collated and, and organized. 
this is a happy day on the courthouse steps. I think all the guys had gotten out on bail. There's two other maze escapees there. Um, Terry Kirby, who you see uh, in the white shirt, third from the left, and Paul Brennan, the short gentleman you see in the black shirt and the gray jacket on the right with bras and hand behind him. And that's Kevin at his apartment in San Francisco while he's out on bail. Um, this is a photograph of the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal hearing that occurred in Belfast in 2020. And uh, I took that photograph and the lawyers that you see, you see the lawyers there wear wigs to court as do the, the justices on the bench. And these are the two lawyers that did a lot of the work on Kevin Barryard's successful appeal of his murder conviction, uh, Fertile Shields and Eamon Ray of Northern Ireland. That's what that courthouse still looks like today. There, you know, the, the Good Friday Agreement is 25 years old and the IRA is gone. Um, and yet there's still, what I see is this residue of the troubles in the North. And one of those, or one aspect of that, one manifestation is these peace walls, these large physical barriers that separate communities from one another. Protestant neighborhood from a Catholic neighborhood, so that if any trouble should erupt, especially on a patriotic holiday like the 12th of July, people will be physically separated from each other. Those walls are supposed to come down uh, before the end of the year, but a lot of people want them to uh, stay up because they do seem to have uh, a good effect. You saw the photo of Jerry Kelly earlier with the, the hippie-like hair and the, the surly expression on his face. This is Jerry Kelly today uh, in his office. Um, I took this photograph uh, a few years ago. He's now a member of the Legislative Assembly of Northern Ireland, the former violent revolutionary and now part of the government and also part of the Police Oversight Board. Um, that's Peter Heathwood, who was shot, ac not accidentally, but in a case of mistaken identity, the paramilitaries who broke into Kevin Barry Art's apartment or the house where his apartment was mistook his landlord who lived there also with his family, Peter Heathwood for Kevin. And they shot him. He was not killed, but he was paralyzed and he uh, remains paralyzed today. He took it on himself after this to um, collect video of uh, memorial services and funerals of anybody who'd been killed in a troubles related event and then give those videos to the families. And um, this is a photograph that I took of him in his home studio where he creates all these videos. And uh, there are a couple thousand of them. That was the last one. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's a slide. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. When we see the prison, it's just astonishing that anyone could escape. Now, if you told us about the food truck of those people that were still at large, had they all used the same device? Yes, they all loaded themselves into the back of that truck. There were 38 of them, and the truck drove slowly from gate to gate, from what they called airlock to airlock, and got waved through on every occasion. And then the plan was when they got to the front gate uh, to get control of the control room. Um, and they got in there, and then some guards uh, started to fight back. And uh, they eventually got the gate up. But by that time, the alarm had been sounded. There were sirens going off everywhere. And so the guys that were in the back of the truck all piled out of the back of the truck and they all bull rushed uh, the gate to try to get out. Um, and shooting started and it was a complete pandemonium. Um, some guys got away, some guys got caught right away. Um, so there was basically just one incident with the truck. They yeah, it, it was planned over a period of months. And um, Kevin 
found out about it the morning of, and he was kind of an odd duck or sort of the odd man out because he was not in the IRA. He was never in the IRA. And so when he arrived at the maze, convicted of a, a notorious IRA murder, uh, they didn't shun him, but they definitely treated him like uh, they sort of left him out of things. Uh, they didn't like him. Um, he used uh, hashish that had been smuggled in. The IRA was very anti-drug. Um, but on the morning of the escape, he was asked to attend a meeting. He thought he was going to get beat up or disciplined because he'd been using hashish. And uh, to his surprise, they said, there's an escape on today. You have a life sentence. So if you want to come, you're in. Would you like to come? And he said, yeah, of course I would. So that was how he got on the escape, sort of almost as an afterthought or at the last second. Yeah, there's another question. Um, What's your name? My name is Dave Heskin. I'm chemical engineering 69 grad from New York right here. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I get, uh, Kevin was, was uh, as I understand, was falsely accused, or they had false witnesses, or, I mean, he didn't murder the guy. Correct. He did not. Okay. He was innocent of it. So how did how did um, so the extradition at the time he was trying to be extradited, he was still you know, convicted, or they, yeah, or he still, the the uh, how do I how do you say it? He, he was still convicted. They still had to to um, recognize his innocence. So they so first first. You stop the ex they stopped the extra extradition and then they retried him. How did they how did they find out that he would be You're right. He had the murder conviction and he also had a prison escape conviction right. issued in absentia. And he was living underground in California under an alias and hoping that they would never find him. Of course they did find him. And if you're interested in hearing about how they did that, I can tell you. But um extradition is a creature of treaty between countries. And the United States has extradition treaties with most countries, but not all. Uh, for example, we don't have extradition treaties with com with countries that are our adversaries or enemies. But for a long time, we had an extradition treaty with the UK that um, had a clause in it called the political offense exception. And this clause enabled IRA people who were on the run uh, when sought for extradition back to the UK to claim that their offense had been committed for a political reason. And if they could prove that in an American court, the American court might refuse to extradite them. Um, the British always hated that. And when Prime Minister Thatcher got into power and after President Reagan was elected, the very first visit President Reagan received from a foreign leader was from Margaret Thatcher. She was at the White House maybe a few days after the inauguration. And the number one thing on her agenda was to rewrite the extradition treaty and write the political offense exception out of it. Um, and that was done because those two had a very close relationship and President Reagan was, he, he saw the world in a lot of ways in the same way that uh, Margaret Thatcher did. But when the amendment got to the floor of the Senate in 1986, the Irish American senators got together and decided they needed to rewrite the rewrite. The political offense exception wasn't coming back, but they thought there needed to be a clause in there whereby if you were sought for extradition and you could show it was a trumped up charge or that you had had an unfair trial in the first place, you could beat extradition. And the Senator that was essential to that process is now our president, uh, Joe Biden. He, I don't know if he wrote Article 3A himself, but he was instrumental in getting it uh, put into the treaty. And so by the time Kevin Barry Art's extradition trial rolled around in San Francisco in 1996, you know, Article 3A, what does it mean to have trumped up charges? What does it mean that you had an unfair trial? Can an American judge, should an American judge be passing judgment on the judgment of a British judge? Is that gonna damage foreign relations between our ally uh, and the United States. All of this was a blank slate, legally speaking, for uh, Judge Legg, because Article 3 had never been litigated before. It was brand new. Um, so there were some novel uh, legal issues. That was a really long answer to your question. I'm sorry. Wow, so long. Did I answer? 
is the first part. The second, the second part was how did they, how did they then find out that the charges were that he was falsely accused or that he didn't do it? There'd never been any uh, forensic or other evidence against him in the first place. There was an eyewitness to the murder who was the son of the victim, whose name is Alan Miles, who was 21 at the time, who saw the whole thing. But neither he nor his mom, who also saw the whole thing, were called by the government to testify at the trial. No, he wasn't called. She was called and asked to look at the room and see if she recognized the shooter, and she could not. The one piece of evidence they had against him was his confession. Um, and false confessions, coerced confessions, uh, were very much a staple under the emergency laws of the British legal system. There was a high number of them. And um, when I grew up, you know, I grew up you know, uh, a deracinated white kid in Southern California watching police dramas like Adam 12 and Columbo. And the idea that somebody would falsely confess to something was just unthinkable to me. <laughs> Why would you ever confess to something that you didn't do? Uh, but in that system, it was very common. And today, and I don't know how many law students here are interested in criminal uh, careers in the criminal law, but um, we have a lot more data today about false confessions than existed in the early 80s. And the examples, you know, Central Park Five, you know, I mean, we're not just not here to criticize the British for the sake of doing it. If you want to find terrible episodes of false confessions, coercion of confessions, American legal history will give you plenty of, of, of recent illustrations of that. The Central Park Five maybe being the most notorious. Um, but um, Salahi, you found the Salahi thing for me. The Lewis one, let me see. Mohammed Salahi was uh, scooped up. He is from Mauritania during our war on terror and uh, deposited in Guantanamo Bay and kept in a very special cell that was called Echo Special. He was thought to be a high value detainee. Um, you know, they they wouldn't even report to the media that he was there. They they would refuse to acknowledge that such a thing as Echo Special ever existed. They kept Mr. Salahi at Guantanamo for 19 years never charged him with anything, and finally released him and flew him home. Uh, he later wrote a book about his experience called Guantanamo Diary. But Muhammad Salahi confessed to all kinds of stuff that he had never done because uh, he was tortured by our people. And he was, you know, uh, the FBI was in there, the CIA, MI5 was in there, other agencies were in there. And um, I found something that he wrote in his book about uh, the level of detail that you have to give when you're giving a false confession to make sure your interrogators are satisfied that it will hold up in court later. He writes, the problem is you cannot just admit to something you haven't done. You need to deliver the details, which you can't when you haven't done anything. It's not just, yes, I did it. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to make up a complete story that makes sense to the dumbest dummies. One of the hardest things to do is to tell an untruthful story and maintain it. And that is exactly uh, where I was stuck. Are there other questions? Any other questions? You had a question. Ryan. I'm just curious. Uh, the, I kind of the star of the Keenan Review of 2023, by the way. One of the stars. I was going to ask how um, they kind of like thought it was in in 1978, uh, there was a, an IRA man who was a double agent. His name was Maurice Gilberry, and he uh, was in the pay of um, the special branch of the RUC, the Northern Ireland Police, and he frequently um, would betray his colleagues to them, which resulted in some of them being killed in ambushes at the same time that he was going out and doing IRA operations and, and killing people on his own. Uh, Maurice Gilberry was uh, interviewed after Albert Miles was killed and asked, do you have any information? Do you know who might be responsible for this? He gave some names. One of the names he gave was Kevin Berryart, who happened to be, um, who happened to have impregnated 
the girlfriend of Maurice Gilberry's best friend who was serving time in the maze. Why not throw him under the bus? And so he was thrown under the bus. And then once he was in Castle Ray, the first time he spent seven days in there under interrogation, didn't, didn't confess, was released. Three years later, they still didn't have a suspect. So they brought him back in. And this time they got him to say that he had done it. Um, other questions? Yeah. You know who did it? Yes. Who? Um, if you'll meet me tomorrow at Legends <laughs> at 6 p.m. after the game or as soon after the game, after 6 p.m., whichever is later, I will tell you. Or if you buy a copy of the Buck Brown and you skip to pay, okay, have you gone to the end yet? You did it? You have proof that. <laughs> what do you got? He's a lawyer, of course. <laughs> well, the comment is he's a lawyer. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that too. Um, well, for those who haven't bought the book, I'm reluctant to give away the end of the story. But I will tell you this. Uh, two weeks ago, I met Alan Miles, the son of the murder victim, for the first time. In, um, New York, where he was visiting with his son. And uh, he said on that occasion, um, when I looked through your illustrations uh, and I saw the photograph of Maurice Goberry, I didn't know a photo of Maurice Goberry existed. But when I saw that photograph, it clicked. That was the man that I saw shoot my dad. And I thought, I'm not a total incompetent, you know? Uh, and I don't know, closure is a word that gets overused, but um, I believe Maurice Gilberry did it. And for reasons explained in the book. So there were two people that were blown up. Blown up. What do you mean? Uh, wasn't there uh, the There were two gunmen. The 35 and the 38. The 38 and the 45, right. The guns. Yeah. <clears throat> The guns were found at Northwick Drive after two IRA men who were handling a bomb accidentally blew themselves up. Yeah. The guns were impounded and determined to be the murder weapons and then not given to the defense team of Kevin Barriard's lawyers. So those two people were not the two no. sales. No. No. And the IRA at, at that time had a practice of they would hang on to weapons. They would get hold of weapons, they would store them, and then those weapons would be used on this or that operation. And then they would be brought back or put in another safe place. So the same weapon might be used, you know, several times. Okay, there was a comment over here about he's a lawyer. Are you the one who said that? Who said that? You said that. Um it was it was important to me when I did this project that the reader not feel that he's a lawyer. He was part of his, you know, defense team for a time. He has an agenda. He's writing essentially as an advocate and not as an objective storyteller. I wanted to destroy that or at least, you know, defuse it. So when I was talking about the rights with Kevin Berryard and our contract, which we wound up signing in, 2016, it was really important to me that he waive all of his privileges. I could write anything that he'd ever said to any of his lawyers or what, what they'd said to him, that I had complete control to write whatever I wanted, that if I found out that he was the murder of Albert Miles, that I was going to write that, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. And he agreed to that. And I, I did that. And you should also know, lest you think I'm an advocate or something, um, in July, when we were in galleys and on the eve of publication, he, at the last second, objected. There were passages in the book that he didn't like, thought portrayed him in an unflattering light or might piss somebody off back at home and um, demanded that I change them or take them out. And I told him I wasn't going to do it. He contacted my publisher in secret and threatened legal action and told them that I did not have the right to do the book. And I came this close to getting dropped by my publisher because they were afraid of getting sued. But they stuck by me in the end and you know they published it. He has not brought legal action, of course. It did 
result in our relationship uh, being destroyed, which mm -hmm. I'm very sad about. What, what was he so what was he so upset about? Uh, he thought the book, uh, in a place or two, portrayed him as a womanizer, which he was. <laughs> Uh, it, the book said that Jimmy Smith was drunk that day at the bar in San Francisco when he was supposed to be picking him up at the airport, which he was. Uh, and he thought, Jim, you know, this might piss Jimmy Smith off. And you know. and I saw this with Alan Miles and with Kevin Berryard and with other people that I've met and known from Northern Ireland. They grow up. If there's one word that describes it, it's fear. There's fear in you know every molecule of the air. Fear that you know I'm going to antagonize the wrong person, and then that person is going to shoot me, or you know a relative of mine is going to get denied a job because I said the wrong thing. Uh, in certain quarters, this book isn't going over well in Belfast with uh, members of the Republican side. Because this book reveals for the first time that Pat Finucane, uh, the late uh, famous lawyer who was murdered, um, was going overseas to help IRA fugitives live on the land. They're not mad because it isn't true. <laughs> They're mad because it, it's in the book and that, that makes Pat Finucane look like less of a saint. Uh, than he supposedly really is. And he was saintly in many ways. Um, but, uh, yeah, fear would be the answer to that. You know, his wife was against this project from the first day, and I think she's got something to do with it, too. Yeah, what else? Do we ask? Okay, so we have law students here, people that are interested in law, so I wanted to say one last thing, and I want to keep you on time, too, and I know it's a home football weekend, and Hank has probably got some cooking to do. Um, in Granger? No, not really. No, I got all kinds of questions. Oh, uh, well, yeah. ask, ask one. No, there's other gentlemen. Well, I, I, I yield my time. <laughs> okay. All right. The senator from Indiana yields his time to the gentleman. Yes. Uh, from a non lawyer uh, and a guy who doesn't cannot think as logically as you do and probably much more subjective. So you take this book and objectively, are writing it because of your interest and you see obviously redemption and justice and so it's hanging out there and it will go nowhere until someone until it's adjudicated or until it gets in court in other words this man is still living you've helped him to think through you've written something so the information is hanging out there and nothing happens until someone picks up your book and tries to make something up and then it gets into a court. Is that how things happen? I would say no. Uh, I thought it was a good story before Alan Miles gave me the HET report, which for the first time revealed the existence of these weapons and the knowledge that they had the Albert Miles murder weapons in their possession and never gave them to the defense, which could have helped the defense because the description did not match what was in the confession. Um, Alan Miles, unbeknownst to me or Kevin Berryard, the Northern Ireland government had launched a, an agency called the Historical Inquiries Team, the HET, to try to help families who had lost family members in unsolved murders, you know, find new evidence, try to get to the bottom of what happened. This was done at the request of Alan Miles. He contacted the HET and they produced a report which he gave to me uh, unsolicited and which I gave immediately to uh, Kevin Berryard and to his lawyers in Belfast, who then turned around and used it to attack his murder conviction, which was reversed by the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal in 2020. So you write this, uh, sorry to keep on here, but you write this for a sense of justice and to be a good author or whatever your motivations are. And the case is still out there, right? Correct? No, the case is over. Uh, his murder conviction was, was thrown out by the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal. So, he... so it serves as a great learning tool for anyone who wants to read about law 
and know more about what's going on. Uh, you would have to ask them. I don't know. And you asked why I wrote it. I wrote it to get a girl. She's right here. It worked out. We just got married. So she liked the book. Uh, the role of lawyers. Okay, so we have a lot of students here today. So when when you read the emergency laws or when you read um, of some historical injustice, consider the you know, we're told all the time how wonderful our profession is. It's such a noble profession. We have these standards of ethics and all of this stuff. And th and that's true, okay. But what historical injustice has happened to a group of people, whether it's in Northern Ireland or the United States, the Jim Crow South, wherever, what's going on right now in, in Russia and the treatment of dissent there by um, the existing government that wasn't engineered, designed, implemented, made possible by attorneys who would say, I'm just doing my job. Um, I'm just doing my job here. Basil Kelly, you know, would have said that. Uh, Ronnie Alton, the prosecutor, would have said that. The cops that arrested him, the detectives that got him to confess falsely would say, hey man, I, they told me the basic data, they told me to go in there and get the confession, and I did, what do you want? It's my job. Um, I found something called the Flags and Emblems Act, uh, which was a statute that was enacted in Northern Ireland uh, in the 60s. Let me see if I've got it. Because I think it's interesting if you're interested in the law. Um, okay, 1954, pardon me. The Flags and Emblems Display Act. Any person who prevents or threatens to interfere by force with the display of a Union flag, usually known as the Union Jack, by another person on or in any lands or premises lawfully occupied by that other person shall be guilty of an offense against this act. Okay, well, you know, that's a law against desecrating the national flag, big deal. Uh, but this is where it gets a little more interesting as far as if you're a lawyer and you're crafting a statute, if you become a legislator or someone who works in the Congress someday, um, where any police officer having regard to the time or place at which in the circumstances which any emblem is being displayed, keep that word in your mind, emblem, apprehends that the display of such emblem may occasion a breach of the peace, he may require the person displaying or responsible for the display of the emblem to discontinue it. Um, and then it's defined as a criminal offense to disobey that uh, command. Um, in this section, the expression emblem includes a flag of any kind other than the union flag. Okay, so what does that really mean? Uh, if, you, if you're a member of the nationalist community, if you're a Catholic, you live in a Catholic neighborhood and you have a little Irish tricolor, you know, the national flag of Ireland, you believe Ireland should be, you know, reunited. The six counties and the 26 should be together. Um, and you're displaying that emblem, um, it's a criminal offense uh, to do it. And um, your Irish tricolor, which is not called that, it's called an emblem, can be seized and detained and you can be put in jail and, and fined for doing it. But if you are a loyalist and you're marching through a Catholic neighborhood on one of their big patriotic holy days, like the 12th of July, the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne, and you're waving the Union Jack around and you're saying, fuck the Pope and not an inch and all of this, and you're creating a riot, the police are not allowed to interfere with what you're doing. You know, I mean, lawyers thought that up. Right? You know, it just seems, but it's done in, in language that seems very antiseptic and um, correct. So there's going to be occasions in your career, whether you're working in government or you're in private practice, when you're going to be called on by your client or your superiors to do something that maybe clashes with some of the things that you've been taught here. Um, and you're going to go along with that or you're not. And if you don't, it may cost you your career or cost you some career advancement. And um, that's what happened with our profession in Northern Ireland. Now, lest you think that's all very overly negative and critical. You know, let's take the good with the bad. You know, for every Basil Kelly, there are these three justices of the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal that threw out his murder conviction. Um, you know, for every Mark Zanitas, the prosecutor who 
you know, did this extradition case on behalf of the U.S. Attorney's Office. There's a Jim Brosnahan who gave up, I don't know how much in income in order to do this case for, for eight years. Um, there is Rosemary Nelson who got shot, to, blown up and killed in her driveway because she was defending um, Republican clientele and Pat Finucan. Uh, they didn't all succeed, but uh, some of them were very uh, noble and did some really good things. So that's kind of a long rambling. Okay, how are we doing on time? I'm talking too long. Are there any more questions? You, wait, uh, the senator from Indiana had some questions. It's your turn. Uh, a couple of things. Yeah. I, one, one part about the book that I, I really enjoyed was it not only told the story of Mr. Arndt, but also about what it was like to live in those circumstances at that time. Um, what, but the question that keeps coming to mind to me and to Sarah, she had the book too, we would talk about it, was why didn't he get to move a few miles south? I mean, it, it, it's hard to be imagining, put yourself in that circumstance and think yourself a prisoner because you basically are living in your own home. When things got rough for uh, my family in Iowa, they moved to California. And that's really a very American experience. If things aren't going well, you move away. And one of the things I had to learn was in that part of the world, that is not the thinking. And there are some reasons for that. Some of it at the time was just sheer economic deprivation. If you don't have any money, you, you can't afford to move anywhere. You can't qualify for an apartment. If you don't have any family south of the border that would take you in, you know, you're stuck where you are. And or if you have a wife and she has family that live nearby and you have kids and they're in school, um, there's a real resistance towards um, moving away. There was a point where he moved down to Dublin um, for a few months. But the reason he moved to Dublin wasn't that, you know, he thought it sucked in Belfast. He, he moved to Dublin because uh, his wife kicked him out um, because he was a womanizer and because he had an aunt and uncle down in Dublin that would take him in. Um, and when he finally came to the States, it was because he was on the run, I mean, literally for his life. That's what it took. It was interesting to me that when I, I did the research on the escapees, what happened to these 38 guys? How many got killed? How many got caught the same day? How many wound up in California? How many were never heard from again, all of that. I found that of the ones who were still alive, the number of them that not only stayed in Northern Ireland, but lived within 30 miles of where they'd grown up, what was something like 80%. I just, you know, all these guys are getting hunted. Why would you do that? Maybe that would be the last place that you or I would, you know, we would go somewhere where nobody knew us. Uh, not in their, their thinking, yeah. Was there one more question back there? Yeah. Um, I'm not too familiar with the Good Friday Agreement, but you mentioned how many years later this was after that agreement and why these um, men had to like litigate their past like convictions, uh, where I don't know the details of the Good Friday Agreement, but I thought IRA members had been pardoned or were able to go free. So I wonder why they weren't included in that. Chronologically, uh, these guys, the, the so-called H Block Four, Kevin Berryard, Terry Kirby, Jimmy Smith, and Paul Brennan, were all sought for extradition in the early 90s. In parallel, at the time, the Clinton administration, through Senator George Mitchell, was working with the parties in Northern Ireland to try to end the war. Uh, and those two things just happened on separate tracks. And the U.S. Attorney's Office, you know, had laser focus on extraditing these guys. They worked for the British. That was their attitude. And Senator Mitchell and President Clinton were doing what they could try to do. You know, they knew there was an extradition case going on, but let's try to see if we can get these guys to make a deal. And they did in 1998. It was announced on Good Friday, 1998. And that agreement essentially said the IRA is disbanding. All the weapons are going to be decommissioned. I didn't know what decommissioned meant. I'm not sure to this day that I, I know. Um, the British Army is going to depart, and the future of the people of the six counties will be determined by a vote of those people. 
not by an island-wide vote, but by the majority of the people living in the six counties. If, if the day should come when they want to be reunited with the Irish Republic, they can vote for that and they will have it. If they don't do that, then the six counties will stay politically separate. That was a Good Friday Agreement in a nutshell. But the prisoners, the men in the maze, were all to be walked by the year 2000, no matter what they had done. Triple murder, you know, we're going to walk everybody, loyalist or Republican, and they did that. So when these guys had their extradition case uh, come to the Ninth Circuit in 1998 and the Good Friday Agreement was announced, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, wait a minute, why are we adjudicating the, these extradition cases? All these guys are supposed to get walked under the Good Friday Agreement. Why, why are we doing this academic exercise? The British fought it. And they said, well, no, they have to be extradited back so that they can be walked. Which I thought was stupid. Uh, and so did the Ninth Circuit. And that, that court, to its credit, issued an order to the British government. said, show cause why we should not just dismiss the case. And they saw the writing on the wall and they dismissed it. Um, so that's the chronology of what happened. And then why did the case of 2020 have to happen? He always felt that that was a rotten conviction, that he was innocent, that it was a stain on his, not only his reputation, but his immigration status in the United States. And under prior law in Northern Ireland, if you wanted to challenge a criminal conviction, you had to be physically present in the country. Okay, you could not do it in absentia. But that law changed in 2017. There was some case that was, to, you know, a guy challenges conviction from overseas, and the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal issued a new rule of law and said, yeah, it can be done. When that happened, Kevin Berryart learned about it, and he contacted his Irish lawyer, um, who at that time was a guy named uh, Peter Madden, and said, can, can we do this? Because if we can do it, I want to do it. And if it can be paid for at public expense, I would like that too. And the answers were yes. And so that's how that um, came out. Okay. Yes, this gentleman. We'll take uh, to stay on time here. We'll take two more questions, and then uh, we'll have a final uh, remark, and then I'll let y'all go. Yes, sir. Uh, this brief, um, Dennis Fan, Maggie, class of sixty sixty nine. Um, real quick, we we've been in Ireland a lot. Married to Maggie Kelly. I noticed there's quite yeah, a few Kellys in the <laughs> But uh, our last time in Belfast, I was trying to remember the year, but I think it was 15, 20 years ago. And uh, our brother Loshani was from Ireland. But we, we wanted to go see the, the wall, the Catholic section, and all that. And we wanted to take a taxi. I think you noted that Kevin was a Catholic ta taxi driver. And I don't know if it's still the case today, but there's Protestant ta ta taxis and then the black taxis with the Catholic taxis. So we said, you better take a Catholic. <laughs> and it was a very interesting ride, but very tense. And at one point, he said, "We got to get out of here." So you said every molecule of fear. Okay. It was very tense. Well, after the the peace agreement, obviously, but very tense there. The wall was very prominent. I'm happy to be there. Maybe they'll take it down, but I can understand why maybe not. So your most recent visit to Belfast. Not too long ago, maybe. Is it still that tension in the air that just being around? I would say no, almost completely evaporated, night and day different from my first visit, which was in 1991. When I was there in 1991, I mean, fully armored up, helmeted up, right. British Army soldiers with long rifles patrolling down this country road, sandbags around everything in town, uh, cops, you know. I mean, it was just a very oppressive atmosphere as a tourist at that time. You know, now I mean, there's hotels going up all over the place. There's tons of tourists coming in. They all want to go see the Game of Thrones place. You know, uh, there are thriving businesses and, um, you know, people are enjoying their lives. And well, it's well, my um, last comment today yeah. you're going to make it was in the 80s, we had two kids from over to Catholic girl sister come over for a couple summers on the private children that you've heard about just to get the kids 
in this case, the Catholic kids out of the trucks. And so that would have been pre-91 as well. So uh, that was pretty horrifying. Because they couldn't believe when they got over here. Said, oh, you mean I can do that? Or oh, I mean, you can go here? And uh, it's uh, unbelievable. I have one more question. You had a question. So, thank you very much. It's yeah. really been very fascinating answers for some of the things you come before. But I, I, this might be an aside, but what made the IRA go into what you call psychotic violence? Because in the long run, that did remain, that turned the public against them. Is it, was it just human nature, vengeance, or was there something that clicked? I mean, it really turned out to be psychotic. They saw themselves as in a war. Uh, they, some of them, some number of them, found themselves able to toss a bomb into a bar where they knew, which they knew was entirely inhabited by civilians. And some civilians were going to die. Old ladies were going to die, uh, and die in a horrible way. Um, you know, I threw. You know, I said the word psychotic. Maybe I shouldn't have. But to me, that's on a par with what Hamas did on October 7th. You know, you're burning people alive, beheading babies, you know, taking old ladies hostage and putting them down into a tunnel. What, what gets a person to that place? You know, I've had such a sheltered and uh, privileged life. I've never had to be exposed to anything like that in my life, um, except as an observer or as a chronicler of it in this instance. But there are people that are taught to hate from the time they're in the cradle and they grow up with it. And I think it helps them rationalize some things like seeing other classes of people as subhuman. If they're subhuman, well, they can be killed or tortured without any remorse about the matter because it's all for the greater good. The greater good being, you know, of course, a wonderful cause. Um, you know, was it worth it in the end? Uh, there are a couple of IRA, IRA men that I know that have said, none of what we have today, the Good Friday Agreement never would have happened without all the stuff that the IRA did. I think that's probably true. But was it worth all that suffering just to have the same thing that they could have had in 1972, which was offered to them, which was, you can have a power sharing government, but the six counties are going to stay not part of the Irish Republic unless and until the people vote for that. Now, why did why did they go through all that? It's a mystery to me, in a way. 